Talks live event. I'll come to that in just a moment. And it's in conjunction with the Highland Archaeology Festival. And tonight's talk is about the ILA impact. Uh, my name is Lynn McKeever. I'm the project manager for the ILA Centre project based in Stornoway. And I'm delighted to be chairing this uh, talk this evening. On New Year's Day 1919, the ILS sank with the loss of over 200 men at the entrance to Stornoway Harbour. This talk this evening discusses the research findings. Um, the research was undertaken to fulfil the aim of assessing the long-term impact the tragedy has had on the people and the culture of the islands. We have three speakers this evening. Dr. Ian Robertson is Associate Professor of Historical Geography at the Centre for History, UHI. He has published extensively on both the 20th century history of the Highlands and Islands and critical heritage studies. These interests um, have been brought together in an exploration of the local politics of the Memorials of the Heroes Public Art Initiative and, reporting on this evening, the ILA Impact Research Project. Professor Marjorie Harper is Professor of History at the University of Aberdeen and Visiting Professor at the Centre for History, UHI. She has published extensively on immigration, particularly from Scotland, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her most recent publication being an audiobook based on her large collection of interviews. She directs an award-winning master's programme in Scottish heritage. Finally this evening, we have Malcolm MacDonald, uh, the author of the book, The Darkest Dawn, the story of the ILA tragedy. He is also a director of the ILA Centre Charity, working to establish a centre in Stornoway for visitors and locals alike. Um, before we start, just a couple of quick housekeeping items, please. If you could keep yourself on mute during the presentation, that would be appreciated. The talk is being recorded. Um, you will have heard that message just before. If you do not wish to appear on the uh, recording this evening, please switch your camera off, um, camera and mic off, obviously. And do make any comments in the chat function if you wish to use it. The chat is not recorded. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. Folk, uh, you can ask questions by either raising a hand um, and when invited to, please uh, go ahead and ask a question or again, pop your question into the chat function. Uh, we will do our best to stick to the allocated 45 minutes. There's quite a lot of content this evening. With three speakers, we might run over a little. If we do, we will certainly aim to be uh, finishing this talk by seven o'clock at the very latest. So that then gives me the opportunity to first hand over to Marjorie, who will begin the chat this evening. Thank you very much, Lynn. And um, what I'll do is give a brief introduction and overview and then uh, talk about the context and then hand over to Ian. Um, during this evening's presentation, um, Ian and I will revisit the ILA disaster, first by setting the general context, then uh, by looking at the background to the ILA impact project, uh, followed by an overview of our findings from documentary research and some reflections on the individual and collective memory of coping and the disaster's legacies. We'll finish our contribution by looking at where we are now and where we go from here before handing over to Malcolm to explain about the ILS Centre. So um, the next slide is to do with context. I think um, that will give you a, a list of what the things, the things we're talking about. Um, now, most of you will have heard of the ILA disaster, but for those of you who haven't, uh, I'll just paint a brief backdrop. Um, the time period, the First World War, a conflict in which the Isle of Lewis had lost over 1,100 men out of uh, 6,700 serving, so about 17%. Um, the island had already been on the government's radar before the war, uh, partly because of the persistence of land raiding there in the late 1880s and after it had died out elsewhere, and partly because of its extreme poverty and the congestion of population. Um, for example, in 1905, Parliament had commissioned a special report on the sanitary condition of Lewis, which had uncovered housing conditions more disgraceful, and that was their word, um, than in other islands. So Prime Minister Lloyd George's promise that returning servicemen would be given homes fit for heroes um, did have a particular resonance um, in Lewis. Now on Hogmanay 1918, uh, 280 men, mainly naval reservists from the island, boarded um, HMY Isle at Kyle of Arch. Um, spirits were high as they anticipated a New Year reunion with their families. 
but in the early hours of the morning, within sight of Stornoway Harbour, the ship foundered and 201 men drowned, uh, most of them from Lewis. Uh, so instead of celebrating New Year with the returned servicemen, uh, families spent that day and indeed many subsequent days uh, retrieving bodies out of the sea, but not all bodies were recovered. Um, it was, an, of course, an appalling tragedy which contributed very significantly to the despair that descended um, on the Hebrides, particularly on Lewis, in the months and years that followed. Um, that despair manifested itself in various explicit ways, um, including the renewal of land raids as people became disillusioned with Lord, Lloyd George's hollow promises. Um, it was also demonstrated in a resurgence of the safety valve of emigration, particularly in April 1923, when within a single week, nearly 600 people famously left Long Island for Canada. Uh, the despair was also implicit in the reluctance of islanders to commemorate publicly the loss of so many lives, um, either in the islands as a whole or in the communities most severely affected. Um, the first monument overlooking the disaster site uh, wasn't erected until 1960, and the first memorial service wasn't held until 1999. And the general consensus is that it's only with the passing of so-called first-degree bereavement that the way's been opened for unfettered, unself-conscious public articulation of a catastrophe that had been woven deeply, but to some extent silently, into the fabric of social, economic, cultural and religious life in the islands. Now, whatever the reasons for reticence, um, the danger inherent in such a delayed response is that those who attempt to analyze and understand the disaster's impact have no recourse to first-hand recollections or perceptions of the event and its aftermath. We can evaluate uh, contemporary documentation, we can speculate on the paucity of the written record after the initial flurry of reporting, and we can ponder the significance of family law and community folk memory that have been filtered through successive generations. But we can no longer ask direct questions of any of those who were involved. But perhaps we never could. And that's the point at which I'll hand over to Ian um, for his uh, input. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for that really helpful uh, contextualising introduction. Um, and I'm impressed I'm moving the slides at the same time as speaking. Um, now, you mentioned uh, land raiding just then, and um, it, it, it is, I suppose, with that important set of social protests that this project, the ILAR Impact, began. Um, I have researched the land wars for um, many years now and collected oral histories of those troubled times. Consequently, it was rightly impossible not to become aware of the ILR. But what most interested me were the disasters, social, cultural and landscape legacies. I have long believed, for instance, that there was much to be learned about how people coped with and recovered from this appalling individual and collective trauma. Now, the Living Legacies 1914 to 1918 Engagement Centre gave me the opportunity to do that, to do just that, and to do it in partnership with uh, Dr. Ian Donald from um, Aberté University. I hope Ian's here tonight, and indeed various community groups um, on Lewis. Um, Ian has produced, or Ian had produced, the um, Lose the Fallen Fourth app, which became um, both the inspiration and model for um, our project um, Visualising the ILR. Now, Visualising the ILR is an online commemoration which maps the impact of the disaster across time and space. My role was to explore the collective memory of recovery. I soon realised, however, that both the word and reasoning behind it was wrong. We can only talk of ongoing coping, barely recovery. As was said to me, and here I'm quoting, it's still an open wound in that sense. I mean, we still feel it. 
For visualizing the eye layer, I undertook just over 20 interviews, but it became obvious that the app could barely skim the surface of the richness of the memories shared. The desire to go further then led me to a new partnership from which the ILR Impact Project emerged. This explored the resonances of the disaster across much of the 20th century. You'll hear from the ILR Centre later on, but their aim is to apply what Marjorie and I have uncovered to aid further community healing. The glue which has held the enterprise together is UHI's Anna Paso, and all participants are very grateful to Anna for her expertise, support, and above all, patience as we negotiated what was to prove a very steep learning curve. The ILR Impact um, combines oral and archival research, and as Marjorie has mentioned, we will draw upon that very shortly. But once again, we are only skimming the surface of a much deeper set of insights. We draw on the local, national and worldwide press, on the Free Church of Scotland records and on school logbooks. The aim for this strand being to identify awareness of the disaster across international borders and articulate how the event has been absorbed into the identity and collective memory of the islands in the century since 1919. Our second strand drew on the material gathered for visualising the Isle Lair, and Marjorie and I must again thank the Living Legacies, um, Living Legacies and the H AHRC for their permission to use that material in the way which we do tonight and in our final report to the ILAIR Centre. What we conclude is that the legacy and memory of coping with the trauma of the ILAIR disaster is both tangible and intangible. Transmitted firstly through family and township linkages, in the second half of the 20th century, legacy and memory shifted from a predominantly personal, more introspective inheritance to something more akin to a difficult, emotionally challenging heritage. A heritage expressed from within and maimed and sorry, maimed, made, <laughs> third attempt, made and maintained by those closely affected. It is to a consideration of both strands that we now turn. Marjorie. Thank you, Ian. Um, I've just unmuted myself, I hope. Um, okay, uh, first of all, the results from documentary research. And I've divided this section of the report into a review of the literature on domestic responses, that is um, documentation in church, school and local government records and in the press, and then a review of responses in the diaspora. So first of all, the reaction of the churches. Um, as Ian's already said, in evaluating the reaction of, of churches, I looked just at one denomination, um, the Free Church of Scotland, which accounted for about 70% of those um, on the ILR. Um, I think it is absolutely vital to acknowledge the central place that the church played in island life, uh, not least in the 1920s, uh, when there was a significant religious revival in Lewis. Um, sermons preached in the immediate aftermath of the disaster were reprinted in part in the Stored Away Gazette, um, but while it, the, the, the tragedy was mentioned in denominational records, what is striking in those records is the reticence of reports or reflections. Now, as far as the Free Church is concerned, this may have been because in 1919, um, many parishes were long time vacant. Um, but so there, there was nobody at the helm, in other words. But there are other reasons. Um, there was a general reluctance among clergy to speak about current affairs in public worship. And the lack of obituaries in the monthly record may reflect another concern in reformed church circles, and that is to avoid any impression of praying for the dead or even eulogizing them. Um, there's also, I think, a much more general consideration, which is the stoical and self-effacing nature of island culture, which meant that grief was internalized rather than demonstrated in any public display. 
Um, the avoidance of any claim to exceptionalism was probably particularly acute at the end of the First World War, a war which had caused the deaths of so many islanders, and then, of course, the heavy death toll from the influenza pandemic, which was still ongoing at the time of the Isle Air disaster. So what I'm saying here is that it was felt, albeit tacitly felt, that the Isle Air tragedy had to be absorbed into the wider context of loss and was not to be over-highlighted, uh, not least for fear that it would diminish other sacrifices that had been made in the interwar in, in the war years. But having said all that, um, the tragedy was covered in the monthly record. It was covered in the publications of the General Assembly and it was covered in Lewis Presbytery Minutes. Um, an editorial article in the record mentioned the quote unquote disquieting rumors about the cause of the disaster and the demand for a public inquiry. But most of its references um, over the months following were either to uh, involved in soliciting or reporting donations that were made to the Disaster Relief Committee. So that's the, the free church. Um, in terms of official responses and looking at school and local government records, it might have been expected that school records would commemorate the disaster. But on the whole, this seems not to have been the case. Um, under the 1872 Education Scotland Act, the head teacher of every school run by a school board was required uh, to keep a daily log of issues such as attendance, um, health inspections, discipline, purchases, everything really. But it was impressed on teachers that entries should be impersonal, anonymized, and strict of any hint of their own opinions. And obviously that was an instruction that militated against the recording of any meaningful reflections about the impact of the Isle Air tragedy. And they tended to steer away from many of them, I think, from mentioning it at all, or just a very brief mention. Um, so the school log books were a bit disappointing. Turning to local government records, um, it's hardly surprising that the disaster featured prominently in the minute books of Stornoway Town Council in the weeks um, after it happened and uh, later on too. Um, from early on, there was discussion of whether there should be a public appeal for funds, and that was indeed instituted quite early in January 1919. Um, I've scrutinized the disaster fund subscription books, um, an important source that was generated as a result of the public appeal, and they are particularly useful for reflecting the wide geographical spread of individuals and especially of institutions that responded often very generously. Um, the largest number of contributors by far, about 75%, came from England and included several army and navy officers and men. And I think the wider point here is that at many levels, it demonstrates that the loss of the Isle Air was regarded as a national disaster, a UK disaster, which elicited a huge outpouring of national sympathy that was expressed in tangible monetary form. Um, I found an interesting uh, donation of a pa one pound from Manchester from a, 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 a somebody called Marguerite Agopian, and she was described as a little Armenian girl. Um, now, presumably, she was a refugee from the genocide of, of 1915. So official records. What about the press? Um, now, material in the Stornoway Gazette has been widely quoted in existing publications, especially by Markham. So I, I tended not to revisit that in my own research. Um, just one point in passing, and that is to mention that the tragedy was covered to some extent in the wider Scottish and British press, especially among Highland newspapers by the Oban Times, um, also a weekly publication that had a wide circulation and a traditionally sympathetic attitude towards crofting communities. Now, I'll say more about press coverage in the final section to which I now turn, um, which is the impact of the disaster in the Scottish diaspora and the responses that were made to it uh, from overseas. So impact and response in the diaspora, a resurgence of emigration. Emigration had been a prominent feature of Scottish life um, well before the ILR, but the tragedy undoubtedly contributed to its resurgence in the Western Isles. Um, two million emigrants had left Scotland in the century after 1815, uh, not least in the decade before the First World War, um, with, um, and they were followed by another two million in the 20th century, um, well, the century after 1918. The most significant exodus came in the 1920s, and that was the decade when departures cancelled out the natural increase of population in Scotland uh, for the first time since records had begun. Um, 
Uh, now, since the 1860s, an ever increasing majority of those emigrants had been coming from the central belt, and indeed they continued to do so. But the early part of the 1920s was also very significant in terms of a resurgence in Hebridean emigration. And I've already mentioned this. Um, the spotlight, as I said, uh, fell particularly on April 1923 with the departure of the Metagama from Stornoway and the Marloch from Loch Boysdale, with around 300 on each sailing. Um, there's a largely unspoken link there with the ILA in that some of the emigrants were probably escaping haunting memories or even the lingering burden of survivor guilt. And of the 73 islanders who survived the disaster, 13 emigrated, seven to Canada, five to Australia, and one to New Zealand. And the biographies that Malcolm has provided of these emigrants uh, does indicate that at least two of them left because of survivor guilt. Um, in terms of the recollections of survivors, and perhaps the most detailed recollection of a disaster from the pen of an emigrant is the account um, of Donald MacDonald from Locks, who settled in Saskatchewan and who in the 1950s published an article about his experiences in a Canadian magazine. And that article was subsequently uh, printed in the Stornoway Gazette or reprinted in the Stornoway Gazette. So what about response that was made in the diaspora? If we look, first of all, at newspapers, um, one of my initial and main tasks in relation to researching the disaster in the diaspora was to scrutinize as many newspapers as possible that were published in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, and which are available digitally. Um, Australia and New Zealand in particular have very advanced digitization programs, which made the task much easier than it was in North America. Um, there's nothing particularly noteworthy about the papers I consulted in terms of what they said. Um, most of the reports were identical. They were taken from cables received from London, um, although I did pick up several errors of spelling and indeed of fact, uh, albeit they were relatively minor errors. Um, some of the newspapers in the diaspora made mention of the disquiet that surrounded the alleged cause of the tragedy, but it was a New York-based uh, monthly magazine for diasporic Scots um, called the Caledonian, which was probably most explicit in highlighting the felt need to apportion blame. Um, also in North America, but across the border in Canada, the disaster was covered most particularly in areas of significant and recent Scottish settlement, um, or not just recent, longer term as well, but certainly recent at uh, Toronto and Winnipeg, for example. So that was the response in newspapers. In terms of remittances, um, that led on now to the final sub theme that I scrutinized in relation to the diaspora, and that was the extent of donations received by the disaster fund from overseas and where they came from. Um, many of the overseas press articles advertise the disaster fund and urge their readers to subscribe to it. Um, my spreadsheet of donations made to the fund shows that when it was finally wound up in 1938, the total amount subscribed was £31,400, of which just over £4,000 had come from overseas, most of it from informal group collections and formal Scottish organisations, but also including £322 for individuals. Not surprisingly, most of the societies were in North America, particularly in Canada, and the largest amounts came from Manitoba and Ontario, no surprise there. But there were also surprisingly large donations from South Africa. Um, in my report, uh, I, I managed to marry up uh, some of these donations with letters in the Stornoway Gazette uh, from the individual and corporate donors. And those letters, uh, I think, helped to flesh out the sentiments that um, lay behind the remittances. There isn't time to go into all that tonight. Um, but we are fortunate, and I just, just want to flag this up, in having the record books of one of those overseas organizations, the Lewis Society of Detroit and Vicinity. A society which actually came into existence as a direct result of the disaster. And um, the records include the society's first minute book, which document how the society was constituted in order to raise funds for the relief of dependents of those who had perished. So it was a direct link there. Um, another nugget that survived is an original manuscript letter from a subscriber. Um, while we have the letters that were published in the Stornoway Gazette, um, most of the original correspondence that um, was, was generated hasn't survived. But I'm grateful to Shona MacDonald um, at the archives for alerting me to the letter that was written by one Alexander Stewart, 
who had emigrated from Col 22 years earlier, 22 years before the disaster. And he sent this letter along with the 12 pounds he had collected from Lewis born settlers in and around Graniteville in Vermont. Now that location of Graniteville is of particular interest to me because it was associated more with the Aberdeen diaspora of granite workers than it was with emigrants from Lewis. But clearly there was a, a cluster of emigrants from Lewis who contributed to the fund. And I'll end with a brief quote from Stuart's letter, which shows that although born in Col, he, um, uh, uh, sorry, although, although living in America for a long time, he continued to identify himself with the Lewis pe people from Lewis. He said, um, we are only a few in number here from the Isle of Lewis, but we still love dearly the land where we were born and brought up. Its memory shall never fade away, unquote. In this case, it was a tragic memory. His letter is a powerful reminder of the impact of the ILA disaster, not just on Lewis itself, but among emigrants whose emotional attachment to their place of birth and their practical commitment to their fellow islanders remained undiminished either by distance or by the passage of time. And I'll hand back now to Ian for the next section. Uh, thanks very much, Marjorie. I'll, um hammer through this as, as fast as I can. I'll just get the next slide up. Thank you. So um, what I want to talk about is um, the, um, the, the, the pattern of the individual and collective memory um, of coping with the, uh, the disaster. And um, the first thing to, that I want to, to say is that um, coping remained very much um, an individual process. But it was one that was multi layered and transgenerational. All my informants eventually found about find out about their connection to the disaster. All had an idea over what coping mechanisms their family and community adopted. But beyond that, things got rather um, diverse or get rather diverse. Not everyone coped in the same way then. Moreover, it's very clear that having to cope, well, that wasn't confined to the immediate generation. It was passed on. But we must also be aware that um, the inheritance was by and large intangible. Yes, the occasional memento mori has been passed down within families. Memento mori such as ditty box, medal, photo as we have here or any other artifact but the legacy and coping sorry the legacy and memory of coping remained largely intangible to add more complexity to this the means to coping was both individualized and collective Consequently, it is almost impossible to identify one pattern, one model, to identify the way in which people coped. So popular culture has it that people cope through silence, through, as somebody said to me, just getting on with it. They must have been very sad and depressed, but they had to. If they wanted to keep warm in the winter and fed, they had to get on with the croft work. They had no choice. So silence was the dominant but far from only response. And the decision to not speak was far from universal. Decisions were taken individually, and they were practiced differently across families and townships. For some, silence was total. It was just never spoken about it. But the thing is, they never, never, never spoke to us about it. It was as if there was just a dark veil over the whole thing, a taboo subject. It was as if people regarded it as a curse. But then in some families, it was spoken about. Mothers might speak with daughters and fathers with sons, but rarely was it spoken across genders or personalized. 
For instance, the fact that a grandfather was lost was never mentioned in one family. There, discussion remained on a general level. We can see similar variation of coping within the wider community. So for some, discussion of the disaster never went beyond the immediate family. By, by contrast, in some townships, we always knew who was affected. They just didn't talk about it. But we always knew who'd lost people. It would be known, but it wouldn't be. This unspoken knowledge is a very particular form of silence. Um, it, uh, it is knowledge and awareness, but um, unspoken in any depth. Sorry, got ahead of myself there, but unspoken in any depth. As such, it is the basis um, of the form of longer term support clearly captured in the collective memory. This was the system of the widow's share. A long established practice in communities too well used to disaster um, that was readily extended to the ILA widows and took the form of providing to the widow and those families where the senior male figure had been lost a share of whatever was harvested. If a boat went out, there was always fishes for the widow's families. It is safe to say that I'm only scraping the surface of what I would like to share with you tonight. Time does not allow me to get into discussion, for instance, of the family who would always turn the radio off when an ILR song or poem came on. Um, it doesn't allow me to get into the, 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 the point of um, avoidance of celebrating the new year or indeed of coping through subscribing to conspiracy theories. I simply want to highlight before I move on the connection to spiritual revival or emigration. One person's father, for instance, lost faith in, I think. He lost a bit of heart at the time of the disaster and didn't really want to stay in Lewis, hence his going away. The disaster was overwhelming and some did not cope. For one informant, his aunt's long, lifelong bites of serious depression were occasioned by the loss of her father on the Isle Air. He concluded by saying, I reckon there must be a lot of people in that category who simply couldn't cope, couldn't cope with the actual loss or aftermath, trying to build their lives again. But I will conclude my um, my brief survey here um, by spending a little time on legacy. Uh, it is clear that the memories shared with this project um, comprise an individual and collective legacy. It is clear too that over time that sense of inheritance shifts from the individual to the collective register and the role of external stimuli such as books and television and radio programs becomes ever more important. Central to what was another complex, multifaceted, multifaceted process with the three monuments created successfully, successively at the site. The informal stone cairn, which seems to have sprung up shortly after the disaster. The first formal monument from 1960 to 1960, and the recent monument built to, uh, to commemorate the centenary of the disaster. Intriguingly, the memory work and heritage performances associated with these monuments appears to be less about people being physically present at them than simply knowing they are there. But before we move to conclusions, I'll note one memory practice that is crucially physically physical and performative. It was expected, I was told, that on your first visit, you put a stone on the cairn, a practice she believed that continued to the present day. Here then, in this practice, are individuals signifying their own grief, but also joy joining with a community 
of grievers. Coping then became a difficult, emotionally challenging heritage from below. And now Mars are wrapping up. Thank you, Ian. Um... Okay, so moving to conclusions, I really just want to go through the bullet points that are on the, the screen there, um, because as, as you're aware, we, we don't have a lot of time. So where are we now? Part one of the conclusion. Um, the project has expanded existing analyses or interpretations of the impact of the disaster, with particular reference to oral recollections and how they address the collective memory of the way in which people coped, as Ian's just been demonstrating in his presentation. Um, it's revealed a, a strong awareness of the disaster across national and international borders. Um, the archival research reveals how the event has been absorbed into the identity and the collective memory of the islands in the century since 1919, or just over a century since 1919. Um, and it reveals also the way in which the disaster was commemorated in the religious culture of a deeply devout society. So that's the archival research. The collective memory of island-wide coping strategies um, reveals that uh, this is a set of, largely a set of memories based on the intangible. Um, as he has demonstrated, it's difficult to identify one pattern or moral which adequately explains, captures, the <coughs> Excuse me, the way in which people responded. Um, thirdly, silence is often advanced as the one unifying response, but even here, um, a close reading of the interviews reveals divergence. And fourthly, it took factors external to the individual and often external to the community to break the silence. And in terms of legacy, there is a legacy and a sense of inheritance based on recovery from the individual and collective trauma uh, caused by the disaster. So I'll hand over back, uh, hand back to Ian to uh, deliver the final part of the report, the uh, part two of the conclusions. Thank you. Thanks, Marjorie. And, and before I hand over to Malcolm, his tag team ex excellence, um, for our, hand over to Malcolm for our final word. Um, I'll say a very brief something about um, what we think of, of as our next steps. Now, there is no doubt in our minds that the legacy of the ILR resonates across and is interwoven with the social, cultural and economic processes which shaped the history of these islands across the 20th century. One last quote I would suggest perfectly illustrates this. What do you think, Mum? The trauma of the ILR, it's not actually gone away, but is this about the first generation not to be acutely upset? I would say so, yes, probably. Not our generation, but possibly the next generation. This is why the Visualising the ILR app was such an appropriate form of memorialis memorialisation. It reached across physical limitations and directly addressed the diasporic community. We aspire to develop that approach further. But the connection and the legacy we are convinced exists is an underexplored one. It is this likely central role of the disaster in the social, cultural and economic processes evident in the islands across the 20th century, which we would now like to investigate. We aim to do that in partnership with the ILR Centre and historical societies across the islands. It is therefore fitting that we leave the last word to one of the Centre's directors, Malcolm McDonald, over to you, Malcolm. I'd like to thank you, Ian and Marjorie, for your most interesting presentations. Having to follow you is rather daunting, as you can imagine. Uh, to, just, just to underline what Ian said, uh, in, in 1958, I was 10 years old, and it was only then that I realised or was told that my grandfather had been lost on the island and that he was one of a third of the 201 men lost who, whose remains were not recovered. 
And uh, my mother had told me about the Isler disaster, but didn't mention my grandfather at all. And she had witnessed bodies coming ashore uh, on Sandwick Beach near which, where she lived. And that, that was besides the R&R &R base in Stornoway. It, it's, uh, my father had even taken me fishing beside the marker where the rocks are, and he didn't mention anything. There's just silence in my family. I know your findings have proven that others, you know, dealt with grief differently, Ian. However, I'm diversifying away from the the, the Isler Centre itself. A, a group of us from Cornanil and Sheer, that's the Western Isles Council, the Stornoway Trust, the Stornoway Port Authority, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Lord Lieutenant and members of Comanechri got together initially to see what could be done. The main driver was Stuart Graham, a man uh, who's the director, Manchin director of Gale Force, which has uh, businesses in Stornoway, Inverness, Canada, uh, Cornwall. It goes on and on, he's got about 200 employees. And his wife, uh, her, her family, uh, the Matheson family from Oog in Lewis, had, had lost uh, young Angus Matheson from 17 Oog in, and so he was keen to do something and he and Lynn have driven forwards through COVID and from the economic recession to drive the, the you know, the Isler Centre dream forward. <clears throat> the Isler Centre is envisaged, I hope, will bear testament not only to those who were lost, but to the survivors, the fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, wives and children, as well as the descendants who live on today. Some still have to get final closure in many respects, especially those who cannot visit the grave of their loved one that was lost all these years ago. Uh, <clears throat> it may well end up that, that end that the Isler Centre will be a maritime centre with the Isler as the well, the central theme. The uh, islanders have been involved from time of Viking, well, since Viking times, uh, uh, with the Royal Navy, the Merchant Navy, fishing, whaling, emigration, and many other nautical themes. Uh, we have established a site at King Edward Wharf. That's the number one pier in Stornoway, and that was given free, free gratis by the Stormy Port Authority. And we hope that you know, tourists will, which come in on tourist ships will visit the centre in due course. Uh, the, the site itself has been checked for engineering and structural uh, strengths by a firm called Burrow Hapold. And we're, we're now reaching a stage where we will, we're looking for designs of the centre itself. And what will we have in the centre for with regards to the Isle Air. Well, we have I've seen portraits by Margaret Ferguson. She's painted over a hundred of those who were lost and she's carrying on again and some of those who survived. And they are they are wonderful works and hopefully they'll be hung in the center. <laughs> there have been films and videos, the common echris or historical societies throughout the Western Isles have uh, artifacts belonging to those who lost their lives. And uh, there, there, there is also models of the Isle Earth, various things that will go into it. And of course, your own researches. And it's not only uh, uh, written works or, you know, uh, works of art that we would, we, we've commissioned Duncan Chisholm and Julie Fowlers who, in the past have sung songs about the Isle and they're going to do further works and that will be an audio uh, presentation of the Isle and they're probably going to write, well they intend to write about individuals that were in the Isle. Uh, the, the book itself of course covered uh, all, two, all 280 that were aboard with their stories and as, as you mentioned some of them emigrated and one of them actually emigrated to Australia, met his wife also from Lewis and came back to live in Lewis. Uh, 
and well, they both came back together. Uh, the various themes, uh, it, it's but the, the 11 chapters on the book, for instance, was Lewis and Harris before the war, Islanders at war, the boys are coming home, the wreck of the Isler, roll call of the lost and their stories, rumours, questions and inquiries, the long shadow of the, of the Isler, roll call of the survivors and their stories, and then in their own words, keeping the memory alive, and then poetry, verse and song, and could the, a tragedy be avoided? That may form the themes within the centre, but I know with your research, researches, Marjorie and Ian, I'm sure we'll have a few more areas to cover. Thank you for that. Thank you, Malcolm, and thank you also to Marjorie and Ian for your presentation this evening. A huge amount of information and some really interesting findings that have come from the research. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to open up to the floor if anybody has any questions. Um, if you could raise your hand uh, using, there's a small icon on the bar at the bottom of your screen with the, the palm of a hand there. You can use that or you could enter your question into the chat. Okay. If there's no questions this evening, um, then I can open the floor back up to uh, Ian, Marjorie, and Malcolm. If there was anything that you particularly wanted to share with the group, but um, our time and planning didn't allow for it, can I ask Malcolm a question? Certainly. Thank you. In, in terms of you know, you're talking about your family's silence about the disaster. Do you think that was a common cultural trait, not just in terms of big disasters like the ILR, but why, but general sort of family um, um, heartaches? And I'll give you the specific example which came to my mind when you mentioned it. When I was seven years old, I was looking through my mother's um, scrapbook of newspaper cuttings and I came across an entry that had been in the local newspaper two years before I was born saying to you know, my parents a baby daughter born and died I knew nothing about that sister until I came across it in a you know in a newspaper cutting and I said to my mother why didn't you tell me? I mean, I said at the age of seven, why didn't you tell me? She said, well, there was no need for you to know. But I think it was also because it was still very painful for her. Yes, I, I found that in a lot of uh, the islanders, uh, the, you know, as you say, babies die and people uh, are researching the family trees and find that there's perhaps been two babies called Mary or Donald and that one has died, you know, in infancy. And then the next baby is named after them, and so dates of birth, etc., get rather mixed up. But I also recall that the the Dunblane uh, tragedy, and the people there don't want to talk about it. Apparently, when it was the tenth anniversary, uh, they they just didn't. It, it opened up sore wounds, similar to the Isla tragedy. So uh, <laughs> obviously, there's a psychological uh, need to cover cover up one's emotions. Uh, when, when these things happen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I can come in on this. Um, I'm a MacIver, um, and I adore to see Lynn MacIver. Hi. <laughs> because, excuse me. Uh, hello. Can, can, I, I, can I ask a question? My my cousin is Lynn something else <laughs> but um my my mother is is margaret mciver of two main street thornley bank glasgow um and she'll may be able to help you thank you with your research um thank you sorry um somebody was trying to talk to me 
No, no, no problem. Um, if, if you can stay stay on at the end, I can get some contact details from you if you're happy to do that. Um, uh, in, in the meantime, we, we've got one question that's come through in the chat from uh, Rebecca McKinnon. I'll I'll just answer that question, and then Norman will come to you if that's okay. Um, so Rebecca asks, when do you think the ILA Centre will be completed? Um, well, with any big building that doesn't get have all of its funding secured, that's a very difficult question to, to answer. Um, but in terms of, I'll just expand maybe a, 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 just a fraction on what Malcolm um, mentioned with regards to the progress of the project. We have completed the feasibility stage, so the proposed location for the centre has completed feasibility and and whilst the site isn't problem free there there was certainly nothing in there that will prevent us from going ahead with it the next stage for the center is to um, work with the design and to we will in the first instance develop a conceptual design alongside of um, going through the process of working out what will happen inside the building and once those are done we'll then be into the detailed design probably 2025 all things going well is the answer, which is a very, very great answer. But um, that, that's about the best we can do um, at this stage, at this quite early stage still in, in a large project build. So I hope that answers your question, um, Rebecca, there. Uh, Norman, you have a question for us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really, it's, a, it's an observation for Marjorie uh, and probably for others too. But during lockdown, I used the British newspaper archive extensively when I was researching the, the monument in Station Square in Inverness, the Cameron Highlanders monument. Uh, and uh, either, I, I'd, I, I quickly got into the hang of it, you know, set my parameters, the, the dates, the titles, all that stuff. But one day I forgot to set any parameters at all. And I put in what I was looking for, which was a battle, a battle of Tel El Kabir in 1882 and I pushed the search button and of course I got thousands of hits but what was completely unexpected and uh, only only found it because I scrolled through a few pages was that I started finding spikes uh, on anniversaries of the battle 10 years on 20 years on 25 50 years after the battle uh, the, the, there would be reunions of Cameron Highlander uh, groups all over the all over Scotland and also in England too, because a lot of English people uh, served in the Cameron Highlanders because they had a recruitment crisis. So it, it, was, it was entirely serendipitous, but it might be something worth looking at. It, it was it was like a. It wasn't a deliberate mistake, but it was a very fruitful avenue of research. It turned out all sorts of unexpected things. And also I started finding obituaries of old guys who had served in the battle. And when they died, it all came out, all the stories that were never told during their lifetimes. You know, their families and other people started talking about how heroic they were at the battle. So is it just just a couple of ideas for future research, and um, on on the matter of um, survivor guilt, you know, I, I was remembering that, of course, if if the men had all survived uh, and come ashore, they would all have still suffered from survivor guilt uh, because they weren't killed in the in the First World War, uh, and and this is. Maybe an aspect worth looking at too. This disaster brought together the war and a particular event in Stornoway. But the, the the whole way that the community reacted to the war was much the same. People didn't talk about it. Uh, there was a almost a conspiracy of silence. So that was something the community was used to. And then when that when this disaster was piled on top of all that, well, you can only imagine the trauma some people would have faced, especially when their bodies were not recovered. So that that's just a couple of points I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to respond to 
Thank you. Just very, very briefly. Thank you, Norman, for that. I think what you have said about the British newspaper archive demonstrates both the strength and the weakness of um, keyword searching, you know, using the, the digital resource. I mean, it's a tremendous resource and it means that we, we uh, don't have to, you know, go trawling through uh, endless newspapers, but the serendipity element uh, to which you referred is something that you only get by or in your case, not putting in the the, the, uh, the search items, but the search terms, but you, you, which you also get by you know trawling through column after column. And certainly, um, I've come across a lot of very useful information um, serendipitously in that way. Um, I have actually tried to look at anniversaries of the in to, well to do with the ILA. Um, certainly, in, uh, initially in the church records and also in the Stormway Gazette, and I. I, I, it, I looked, I, mean, I, I haven't looked every year, but I certainly looked at 25, 50 and 75 and then the centenary. Um, but you, you're right, uh, you know, uh, casting the net more widely can have um, unexpectedly positive results. So thank you for that. You have your hand up there. Are you um, are you wanting to continue on that discussion, or um, I have another question that's in the chat. If 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 you don't mind, just very briefly, then I'll, I'll pick up something Norman said there because it, it it's very pertinent. Um, you you were talking about um, survivors, Norman, and you know if if it hadn't you know hypothetical history, if it hadn't happened. Um, absolutely fascinating. You know, that would have been um, a large number of um, youngish. Um, active and ambitious men um, arriving back on the island to exactly the same um, social, economic and indeed housing conditions they left up to four years earlier. Um, post November 1918, there was an explosion of land raiding um, on Lewis. But just imagine how much worse it would be if there had been, you know, um, an, another hundred plus people really keen to to obtain land. Um, we might have seen um, a, a, a proper overturning of, of the Lewis hierarchy um, in ways that we didn't quite see um, post uh, post ILR. But thank you for that. Really interesting. Thank you, Ian. Um, th there's a. Uh... A question in the chat that I think is is a good follow on from from that discussion. The question is: there were four events that really happened within a short period of time: the losses, injuries of World War One, the ILA, the Spanish flu, and emigration. Has there been any work done to see how many fam how many families were affected by all four? Ian, yeah. I can see Marjorie's reaction as well, and and I, I think we speak with one voice there. Forgive me, Marjorie. Um, uh, I, I think the answer is no, uh, but I think the um, the the answer also is um, watch this space because Marjorie and I absolutely have ambitions to do exactly that. But I would also add into those four. I would uh, uh, add the burning the the burning down of Stornoway Town Hall. And um, I would also add TB as well. Uh, and um, in in all of those instances, in in the people in in the um, the interviews that I, I did, um, these regularly occurred. And some people, absolutely not many, but some people were drawing all four or six together, and and saying, you know, how on earth did the island recover? in any way at all from there. And and then um, some people would go on to question, you know, whether it did or how long it took to recover. So absolutely that that is, you know, a longish answer to, to a short question. Um, but yes, um, nothing much current research on it, but Marjorie and I very much hope to to continue our research with the ILR Centre in looking into that. Marjorie, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, just really to echo what you said, Ian, um, I guess the, the ILR Centre is like, if you're thinking about like a, a spider or a mind map, you know, that's the core of the body and then everything else kind of radiates out from that as well. Everything is relevant more or less. <laughs> or, a series, or, a, or maybe another analogy, a series of concentric circles. Thank you both. Um...
I hope that has answered that question. Um, if anybody wants to add to that, okay, great. Thank you, see that in chat. Norman, would you like yeah, to? Yeah, just, <clears throat> just to add that um, I'm reminded that Malcolm Wagner Jones did a lot of research on World War I and Ascent centered around war memorials. And he had some very interesting things to say about how the community responded to that. And you, you might find it interesting to track that down uh, and, and uh, chat to him about it. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Okay, um, I'm, I've checked through the, the chat there. Any a last call for questions? No, thank you. Well, thank you all very much for for uh, tuning in this evening and <clears throat> for spending your time uh, listening to this this really informative, very very interesting, a lot of depth um, conversation. And I, ho I hope it's it's been um, enlightening as well. Um, thank you once again. And is there anything else I need to do? To I think I'm handing to Nicola, to, who's going to to tell you about talks that are coming up. So that's it for me. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Yes, just very briefly, just to, to let folks know that our next talk will be on Thursday, the 3rd of November at half past five. Uh, and Dr. Dr. Georgia Valingas will be talking about loyal exchange, the material and visual culture of Jacobite exile from about six, 1716 to 1760. So we hope you can join us then. And thank you again to all our speakers tonight for an excellent talk. Thanks very much. <laughs>